she then went on, after 16 years of working in urgent care, uh, she went on to become a naturopathic doctor. Guys, there is a trend in America today toward us visiting naturopathic doctors. If I were on a blood pressure medicine, a statin drug, uh, you know, any number of medications, any medication, if I were on medications, I would at least want to consult with someone who understood uh, what uh, Dr. Julia understands. She is a joy. John, do you have that picture of her with uh, Berkeley? So uh, my wife and I took our grandson Berkeley to see her. Eh, no. Okay, no problem, John. I know you're busy. Uh, no problems with his health. We, we want him to go in there and see how everything was going. And I'm telling you, he is the cutest kid in the world, he and his brother. And uh, Dr. Julia saw him, and uh, he really, really liked her. I don't think kids are used to going to someone who isn't going to poke them and prod them and maybe give them a shot or give them medicine. And he was just overjoyed. She has a cradle that measures body conductivity. Uh, or, or aberrations, uh, you know, cellular aberrations or energy path aberrations. Your hair is a little hot. My hair is hot? Yeah. Uh, does that look better? Maybe I'll keep it behind the orange here so that looks better. Well, we have extra <clears throat> backlight on it, that's why. You, you guys should see, before we go on one of the sets here, we interview doctors. Um, the sound has to be coordinated, you know, your mouth has to coordinate with the words so the audio... Okay, good. Thanks, John. John's going to put up this picture of Berkeley. All you see is the back of him. Uh, he just took his hand off this little thing, and he's kind of squirming. He's been at this for a few minutes. There's Dr. Julia, and Berkeley's squirming. In front of him on the left there, you can see the hand, uh, uh, the little hand uh, device that he sets. It does look like it's next to Yeah. Yeah, he was such a good guy. Uh, and do you have the other picture, John? Is that up yet? So then she found, you know, he had some penicillin uh, allergy or something. So we go in a room, and she uh, charges up this machine. And we all, my wife and I and Dr. Julia and Berkeley, just sat there and detoxified ourselves to this. I'd love to tell you I better understand this. All I know is I have been referring people to her for years, and the results are incredible. Here's a nurse, a registered nurse, who then became a naturopath. There's Dr. Julia in one of her rooms. And that device is making a little noise, and hopefully it's, and, and I'm not the right guy to explain it. Uh, but Berkeley slept, I will tell you this. Berkeley has a problem going to sleep. You're lucky I lay down, say my prayers, read a little book to him. One more book, Coco, one more book. And, uh, you know, by 10 o'clock at night, we're still laying there. And I said, no, no, it's time to go to sleep now. You have to go to sleep. And he pops up at 5.30. Coco, is it daytime yet? Can I get up? Um, he slept after that visit 11 straight hours. And uh, so it must have had some positive effect on him. I love Dr. Julia. Um, antidepressant Zoloft and generic version in short supply, the FDA has said. Folks, let me just tell you something. From the number of drugs we find ourselves enclosed in our tiny environments uh, taking to the cortisol levels we must be all experiencing. Nobody's quantifying it, but cortisol is uh, it, it's a, a hormone uh, made by the adrenal glands in response to stress, the fight or flight, right? Some, and you see this going all over the streets. I... You know, for four or five nights, I didn't see the word COVID, and wow. But this horrible stuff going on has to end. I'm, I'm not a politician. I'm not going to go any further with that. Um, what I want to do today, my whole intent today is to teach you. So, Mona, when you ask, look, I got a biopsy, and I'm really nervous, Doug. I'm biting my nails. Hear me out on this. I'm going to open with this. I just did a one-hour dissertation that all these doctors... I guess it's sometime in July, and I'll try and give you guys invitations to this so you can see all the doctors that present, and me. I was, usually I'm the only non-doctor that presents at these, and I'm quite proud of that, actually. I want you to know that COVID-19 
is not behaving like a virus at all. So what could it be? I shared this uh, months ago with you. I thought it was quite odd how these virologists uh, could have transferred DNA or RNA. So let me explain that to you. Uh, might COVID be a hybrid disease? I brought my notes from the one hour lecture I gave. Don't worry, I won't keep you that long. Genetic fusion is what I want to talk to you about. Genetic fusion enables two independent organisms to merge their DNA or RNA and form a brand new hybrid nucleic acid. You have these cars that run on gas and electricity, a hybrid car, right? Great idea. The likes of which, if this happened, no one would understand. But I'm a DNA guy. I'm a eukaryotic guy. That word means uh, bacteria are prokaryotic cells. They don't have a rigid membrane. They don't have a nucleus with DNA in it. Eukaryotic cells are fungal cells. Oh, by the by, cancer cells. And I don't think it's coincidental, human cells. So fungal, human, and, uh, uh, and cancer cells are eukaryotes or eukaryotic organisms. So I knew about DNA, and I'll tell you how I knew about it. It's just been a fabulous history, my history. I'm going to try and keep this simple for two reasons. Number one, um, I'm simple. I've had to take these polysyllable words and make them monosyllable words so I could understand. I've studied science for 50 years. I'm one of those guys, you see these guys that come out with eight years of college and they're doctors, 42 years longer than that I've been studying and I thoroughly enjoy uh, what I do. DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, RNA is ribonucleic acid. I didn't know RNA, like from viruses, um, could merge, could genetically fuse, okay? Uh, Self-replicating material, this is DNA, you guys know this, which is present in nearly all living organisms, the main constituent of our chromosomes. It is the carrier of all genetic material. It's called DNA. I want to teach you now something called free RNA. This was totally new to me, cell-free RNA. Portion uh, refers to the non-encapsulated DNA that floats through our bloodstream. How did it get there? What popped the cell? right, with the nucleus in it, with the DNA strands in there. So this is the portion, it's called free DNA, and this is important, that floats through our bloodstream. I used to think genetic fusion was so rare, but I, the, and see if in 10 minutes you don't believe I'm right. So a portion of that free, that cell-free DNA originates in a tumor clone, and there are nucleic acid fragments that enter the bloodstream during apoptosis uh, which is cancer cell death, or necrosis, um, uh, breakdown of tissue. Uh, so DNA we find uh, in our cells, but sometimes freely floating through our bodies. COVID-induced DNA damage. This guy, I really like his stuff, Ben Liu, L-I-U, writes in Medical Hypothesis a couple of weeks ago this. Free DNA, remember what that is? Cell-free DNA floating through our bloodstream. Is it the reason for COVID-19 infection, he asked? The etiology of uh, the cause of severe COVID-19 has been largely unknown. This guy is hitting it dead on. He's a very bright guy. Similar as SARS-CoV-2 and MERS-CoV-2 and SARS-CoV-2 is also uh, thought derived from bat coronaviruses, so is this. However, this is not pathogenic for a bat at all, okay? This free DNA isn't pathogenic to bats at all because free DNA in their cytoplasm or blood cannot bring up a violent immune response in a bat. But it can produce severe inflammation in humans. Um, this is fascinating. This to me is really, when I read his analysis, I thought this is really fascinating. Now, I know DNA to DNA fusion. How? I talked to a doctor at Yale University years ago. I still have my communication with her. Her name was Dr. Lazava. She wasn't real interested in hearing what I had to say. But here's what I had to say. Dr. Lazava, since fungi are eukaryotic cells and carry DNA that's quite like humans, could a genetic fusion happen 
when you get a fungal infection or a yeast infection, yeast is a single-celled fungus, that wraps around my human DNA, and so you end up with a hybrid, something brand new, not my human, not fungus, something brand new. And it would get right through our surveillance system, our DNA, because it's got a human component. Okay, they salute and let it go through. And she said, I don't know, you bring up something interesting. Let me tell you why I asked her. This is Dr. Lozaba at, at Yale uh, University circa June 2013. Man, I'm getting old. She wrote this, cancer, genetic fusion induced cancer metastasis, a gene fusion induces cancer metastasis. Um, cancer metastasis occurs when a breakaway few cells travels somewhere else, get a plexus of capillaries for a food supply, and boom. Bad news, Doug, your prostate cancer is now stage four. It's metastasized to your liver or somewhere else. Here, I want to quote her, Dr. Lazaba and these other researchers. Our results provide the first proof in humans. By the way, this is all going toward COVID. I know I'm talking cancer right now, but I believe, I know, that some cancers are genetic fusions of DNA and DNA. I didn't know DNA and RNA could converge, but I digress. Our results provide the first proof in humans that cancer metastasis can occur when a white blood cell and a cancer cell fuse and form a genetic hybrid. Wow, seven years ago now. I fell out of my chair. Because you see, folks, a white blood cell contains DNA, right? And a cancer cell? What if a cancer cell is a fungal cell? This is what I've been teaching for 50 years. I published on this. So let me change that. Our results provide for the first uh, proof in humans that metastasis can occur when a white blood cell and a fungal cell fuse and form a genetic hybrid. She says cancer cell. What is a cancer? We don't know. We don't know what a cancer cell, we'll never know. It's too difficult, you know. What if it's a fungal cell, which I think it is often, and there's some pretty good science that says it is. Then there you go, DNA, DNA, a hybrid right through your immune system. The question has always been, why my surveillance system, my immune system lets a tumor cell or even fungus get through sight unseen, okay? Uh, this is the first time, well, you'll see. RNA-induced gene fusion can occur in mammalian cells, we are mammals, reveals a study. This is out of Baylor College of Medicine, uh, 2019. The researchers also showed that RNA-induced gene fusion can occur in non-cancerous normal cells. Hmm, those are COVID patients. They don't have cancer. Our results, our research also showed that this RNA-induced genetic fusion, so bingo, in my brain, not only does DNA fuse and, uh, and uh, go on, I believe, to cause cancer, but now we have RNA fusing, okay? But does RNA and DNA fuse? This is fascinating. This research shows that RNA-induced gene fusion can occur in human cells, mammalian cells, in non-cancerous normal cells. You know, Doug, we're seeing asymptomatic people be able to pass this. I'll talk about that in a minute. Genetic fusion isn't new. As Dr. Luke Curtis, who assisted me, I wrote a, a paper. I was uh, one of three authors, Dr. Lynn Jennings, Dr. Luke Curtis, and good old Doug Kaufman. In 2014, we got it published, uh, thanks to Dr. Richard Ablin, we got it published in Oncology News a really good oncology journal. Here's one of the sentences we wrote. Genetic fusion is nothing new. Many viruses, and uh, some of you asking me great questions the other day, Doug, can Epstein-Barr, I mean, are you talking about genetic fusion? Hear this. Many viruses, the Epstein-Barr virus, human papilloma virus, hepatitis B and C, promote human cancers. We, look. The reason we're inoculating all these 10-year-old girls and we're trying to inoculate 10-year-old boys, it's worthy on its cover. Because someday they're going to be sexually promiscuous uh, and, you know, or get married and uh, begin passing, if they have HPV, begin passing it back and forth. I wish I could tell you that this HPV vaccine is perfect, but I'm a guy who interviewed one of the developers of it, okay? So I know otherwise. Uh, I wish I could tell you hep B and hep C 
vaccines. I wish I could tell you there isn't an Epstein-Barr vaccine. But the way these things work is they integrate their DNA into cancer cells. Um, I'm sorry. They integrate their DNA into human cells. And then those cells denigrate to look like cancer cells. But these are viruses in human cells. Uh, the COVID-19 virus is what we call a double-strand RNA a disease. A virus can be, uh, a virus is a parasite in that it depends on a host, be it a fungal cell, and I'm going to cover that, uh, or a human cell. It depends on a host to give it life and to allow it. Viruses and fungi don't have wings. They don't have legs. They rely on us for Uber. Okay, they got to move around by getting on board our cells and transporting themselves. I don't know if I told you this the other day, but I read the most fascinating thing in a science magazine. You know a snail, right? When you were kids, you played with snails. Those little tentacles they have on their head, you'd touch them and, zoop, you know, it'd go down. So there is a fungus that grows on certain trees. This is, I think, Dr. Doug Gill, Dr. Douglas Gill. University of Maryland or something, scientists, who noted that certain uh, snails or slugs, as they climbed up this tree, their snouts, only their snouts became bright red. And he found a fungus on the bark in that tree that turned their, uh, the snail's snout, uh, is that called a snout or their ears, antennas, whatever those are. I'm sure there's a technical name for it. It turned them bright red. Well, this guy is saying, why in the world is that happening? And then he observed, like a good scientist does. He sits back in his yard and he observes. He's seeing these snails start with gray and end up halfway up the tree, which probably takes a week, um, and become bright red. And he observes these birds swoop down and eat the snail. Folks, this is called the ultimate free Uber. It's a taxi ride. All fungus wants to do is move around, but God didn't give it wings. He didn't give it arms and legs. It can't swim. Okay, so it's got to rely on turning the, the tentacles of these snails bright red so a bird can see it. Down he comes, eats it, the bird flies off from, you know, San Diego to Los Angeles, and there the guy sits down. The fungus is now in Los Angeles, free ride. But I digress. Viruses integrate their DNA into human cells. And these human cells, doctors contend, degrade to become cancer. I don't think so, but they do. And that's what's important. By the way, I'm not a doctor. They are. Okay. All cancers are thought to be caused by gene mutations, says Medical News Today, March 2007. At least 33 fungal mycotoxins, there's over a thousand of them. These are poisons made by fungi. At least 33 fungal mycotoxins are known to cause genetic fusions. I mean, this is, okay, we're, we're getting there now. Now I'm going to introduce you to a brand new word. It's called mycoviruses. You guys can't believe this. I teased it Thursday, or Tuesday. Now I want to go over with you. First discovered in 1962. Why is that relevant? In 1962, the word mycotoxin pops up, really, for the first time. You see, in England, Kennedy was in the White House. This is John Kennedy in the White House, a year before he was assassinated. In England, it was probably around Thanksgiving time, there were tens of thousands of turkeys, poults and big turkeys. And they were dying at such a rapid pace, doctors couldn't figure it out. As they died, they do what we do. They sent in pathologists to uh, look at the tissues, you know, do an autopsy. And the pathologist would share notes and share notes and share notes. Well, this one died with a, uh, with a huge lump on the side of its neck. This one had blood occlusion. The, the major arteries broke down and blood couldn't get through. Well, this one, start, the, a bunch of them started hitting their heads against the wall and died. Folks, in 1962, and, and it always is like this. It's always like this. Probably one of the guys who gives them their food figured it out. The pathologist never did. Hey, could it be something in the water? No, we checked the water. Could it be the food? No, we just got a bunch of new, it's called peanut meal, uh, in from South America, Brazil, somewhere. 
some country. And we fed that to all the poults the last two weeks, all the chickens, or all the turkeys last two weeks, and they died. We are so hung up on looking at a dead body, taking it apart, and saying, yeah, okay, you know, that's cause of death. Rarely do we see mycotoxins, they're invisible. A doctor can't say, yeah, old Doug was hitting his head on the wall and his gait was poor and he had Parkinson's type symptoms. He died of a chronic mycotoxicosis. No, no, he died of a guy's name, Parkinson. What did Dr. Parkinson learn in medical school about mycotoxins? Goose egg, nothing. And I, I just find that fascinating. When, oh, Linda died of cancer. You know, my sister died of heart disease. What caused the cancer? Well, well, we don't know. Boy, I hope we go beyond that. So these mycoviruses, at the same time, mycotoxins were found. By the way, aflatoxin was the mycotoxin made from aspergillus mold that grew on the peanut meal. Oh, thanks, John. Uh, that grew on the peanut meal. Um, so first discovered in 1962, something called mycoviruses. These infect fungi. If an RNA and a DNA get together, you know. Like viruses that infect animals and plants, mycoviruses require living cells of other organisms to replicate. Fungi provide those living cells. Mycoviruses have been detected in all of the major phyla, intercellular parasites, symbionts I call them, as obligate intercellular parasites. Mycoviruses reprogram the host cell metabolism in order to replicate within the host cell and avoid antiviral responses. Isn't that precisely what's happening with COVID? They're so mixed up, I don't even want to go into it. This is not a good time to be a doctor. Great people, nurses, great people. But confusion abounds. Every one of them took a couple year course in uh, virology, bacteriology, not mycology, of course, but, but certainly studying viruses uh, and bacteria. Microbiology, it's called tiny biology. And yet, as obligate intracellular parasites, mycoviruses reprogram host cell metabolism in order to replicate within that host and avoid antiviral responses. Symptomless or latent microviruses may have unknown functions in their host. This is in PLOS Pathology, for those of you who want to look it up, in 2015. So the question has to be, does uh, RNA and DNA get together? We now know with certainty that it does, okay? Okay, just quickly, let me go through this. Shared similarities of COVID-19 and histoplasmosis. Bottom line it. Folks, when you disrupt soil, when you sweep, they talk about these monks who had all these problems, these Catholic monks, you know, Spain, early uh, Catholic monks, um, they had those big ceilings, you know, those arched clay ceilings, and pigeons and birds would sit up there and the poop would fall, and, and whoever probably didn't do the dishes had to go down and take a broom and sweep it up. And they suffered horrible respiratory diseases. Histoplasmosis is a disease called by, caused by a fungus called Histoplasma capsulatum. Histoplasma capsulatum can attach to our respiratory system. It's bad. Um, many people carry it around without anything happening, and then as we age, we start wheezing and coughing and so forth. So the similarities between COVID and histo, when, here's what really happened. In 2011, a Wuhan virology lab got almost $4 million from us in the U.S. to study coronavirus. Now, <laughs> you guys, I have friends that are so into this. I don't want to go into it. I don't want to think this horrible stuff happens. I don't want to think this was created to hurt us or put us inside or demean us. It has all the earmarks of that. Like I said three months ago, it has all the earmarks of that. But I don't want to think I've been in a box for three months uh, because some evil people are developing vaccines just for this and then more evil people will mandate those under the guise of saying, well, don't you care about your neighbor? Don't you care about your fellow man? A and I don't want to think that all this rioting and looting and craziness is to hush us and scare us. I don't want to think that, okay? Shared similarities between COVID and histo. Those Chinese virologists 
walked into bat caves. Really, in 2011. Folks, you can booty up a booty, B-O-T-I-E. You can put booties on your, you can wear extra pants, extra sweater, hats, triple gloves, and you're leaving that bat cave with bat guano, uh, uh, histoplasma on yourself. And they took samples. These people took, took stool samples. That's where the histo is from these bats. And then they took the stool samples and their clothing back to the virology lab and probably took their hats and gloves and everything off. And uh, boom, you have converged histoplasma, capsulatum, which induces a disease we call today histoplasma, or histoplasmosis. Bad disease. A lot of people die from it. You've merged those two. But you see, I didn't know when my hypotheses came out weeks ago or months ago that you could even fuse DNA and RNA. You can. It's been done. Mycoviruses with RNA fuse themselves into fungi that have DNA. So maybe I'm on to something exciting here. You get both COVID-19 and histoplasmosis by inhaling the virus or the fungus. People with compromised immunity are more vulnerable. I'm just regurgitating what we've been told forever. Boy, the second rung is going to be dangerous. Get ready. Get in your house. Get 20 more masks. One mask isn't going to do it. It's just like drugs today. If you're on one drug for depression, you need four. What's wrong with you? What's wrong with your doctor? If you have one mask, you need 20 masks. It's getting, to me, and I'm sorry, it's getting comical. This is the craziest thing I've ever witnessed. And I've been in this field for 50 years. I find myself laughing to prevent crying. I should go in my room at night and just cry. Are they that stupid? Well, we think you should wear a mask. Well, we don't think you should wear it. Can't breathe in, you know, carbon dioxide, which you're exhaling uh, all day or you'll faint. Well, but you might spit. Well, that spit never mattered. It was only if that spit got into your face. I mean, this is, this is ch this sixth grade. I did this stuff in sixth grade. It's childish. We don't have an RNA virus injection. Never have. But don't worry. Our heroes are going to be there. And there's already companies with 100 million of them put together. Modera, it didn't work. Don't worry. They're going to get a lot of them. Uh, oh, I know who this was. It's a doctor friend of mine shared the mandates for vaccinations. It differs from state to state. But here's the bottom line. The state governors, those who run the state, go to the doctors. Even if the, vir even if the injection doesn't work, and it won't, um, even if there are tragic side effects, and I'm afraid there will be, if the doctors who head up the CDC and the medical hospitals, the chairmen of the board, those who chair the Department of Immunology, if those say, we've got to mandate this because we've got to care, then it gets done. You're staring down the pipe of one guy that it ain't going to happen to. Greenland looks nice to me after all of this. I'd love to stay in America. I held a gun. I would have used it uh, for my fellow man, be they black or white, rich or poor. Um, that's the point of going to war. Scared for a year of my life, uh, but I'm proud I did it. Okay, so you get... Um, their incubation period is identical, COVID and histo, exactly, two to 17 days. Both can cause adult respiratory distress syndrome. Both cause systemic disorders. Both share near identical symptoms. Those are fever, chills, headache, muscle aches, dry cough, chest discomfort, fatigue, sometimes adult respiratory distress. Both emit volatile organic compounds that dogs can detect. Um, and as we learn more about COVID, we're seeing all the symptoms of histoplasmosis. Now, get this. Just came out the other day. People with mild or no symptoms could be spreading COVID-19. I, I, I just stare at this. If I were a drinker, I'd probably have a couple of beers and just stare at this. People with mild or no symptoms at all, you and me, could be spreading COVID-19. And here's why. Doug's take. Viruses, viri, produce symptoms. Histoplasma 
in immunocompetent people don't produce any symptoms. Thanks, John. Why doesn't, why don't our white blood cells then, hey, Doug, if you're so smart, we have, I know phagocytes, right? P-H-A-G, phagocytes, gobble up. These are white blood cells with tentacles, pseudopods, that gobble up fungus in our body and debris and bad bacteria, right? Get this. I could never prove this until I went to Half Price Books in 1989. I was here in Texas, and I bought a book. The book is called Mechanisms of Microbial Diseases, second edition, Williams and Wilkins, comma, 1989. In the case of fungal infections, sometimes phagocytosis fails. So your first line of defense, right, isn't working. Your immune system doesn't work. In tissue, yeast cells of, and are you ready, histoplasma capsulatum are found within macrophages, immune cells only. However, phagocytosis doesn't always lead to killing of the intracellular inhabitant, fungus, histoplasma, and paradoxically results in protecting the fungus from other defenses of the host. It wins. It turns your snouts red. A bird picks it up and runs with it. Fungus takes over the human body. Paradoxically, results in protection of the fungus. Hey, look, I'll give you, I'll give you some... I'll give you some opioids. Just keep me in your cell and don't let the other cells know it. It's evil. It's evil. And it takes place within our body. And finally, before I get to all your questions, and they're really good, the other day they were tremendous. I tried to answer as many as I can. Can I just take a moment and thank you guys for caring enough to help fellow man? Really appreciate what you do. I see so many nurses in there. I, I thank you guys for for helping me out. Finally this. In 2001, Family Medicine News, a medical journal, well here, this is really good. Folks, with COVID, we end up being polysymptomatic. Oh my gosh, we got chills. Now a slight fever, 100, but don't get on an airplane. Um, oh, my knees hurt so bad. Oh, I'm cramping. So you're polysymptomatic. Family Practice News, uh, issue 18, pages 258 to 265, Family Practice, comma, 2001, said this. Effectiveness of nystatin, all it does is kill fungus. Effectiveness of nystatin in polysymptomatic patients. A randomized double-blind trial with nystatin versus a placebo in general practice. Here's their quote. Nystatin is superior to a placebo in reducing localized and systemic symptoms in individuals with presumed fungal hypersensitivity as selected by a seven-item questionnaire. The superiority is probably enhanced even further by putting the patient on a sugar and yeast-free diet. They took people with multiple complaints and they used a drug called Nystatin 20 years ago and it did great. Enter Doug Kaufman working at one of the big hospitals here in 1986, 87, you know, through the 90s, using that same mentality. We're going to starve these suckers and we're going to kill them. What should we be obligated? Should we owe a fiduciary obligation to every COVID patient to now put them on nystatin? The results, I can almost guarantee you, would be unbelievable because our doctors are good and they're smart. They have no idea about genetic fusion unless they're immunologists or virologists who study this particular field. And to think an antifungal would help, who'd have thought in 2016 that a toenail fungus drug would induce cancer cells to die, would stop cancer from metastasizing. Even your doctor doesn't know that today but it's been documented and proven. Thank you for sitting, boy, that was a little longer than I wanted, but thank you for sitting through that class. Now tomorrow I want you to read the book, The Germ That Causes Cancer. Um, thank you for the great comments I got on that. Um, there was one, read your book, Stu and Zanley. Read your book, The Germ That Causes Cancer, and had the biggest and best influence on my life. You opened my eyes to the fungus that was killing me. With a history of ovarian cancer in 2003, 
by the by, this came in Tuesday. She's alive 17 years later. To the, uh, to the, the number of autoimmune diseases that rack my body, to the years of chemo, I am rebuilding my immune system. My rheumatologist, now are you sitting down? My rheumatologist recommended beta-glucan. Love him. I started NSC 100 months ago. He upped it to two a day. When and how is the best time to take these? Uh, both at the same time of the day or stagger them? I stagger mine. I'll take beta-glucan in the morning. Um, I told you during, now it's warm out, it's hot. Um, and so the flu viruses have kind of flown away. So I'm back to 100 NSC 100, which is 10 milligram, uh, once a day. And I'll take it either in the morning or before I go to bed in the evening. I think it works equally well with or without, um, with or without food. So do you understand where I'm coming from this, folks? You're not going to hear this anywhere else, I guarantee you. The day someone, and it's coming, the paper's going to come because it has to. I hope you can help me find it. One day, haven't we found that vitamin D3 helps these patients? Haven't we found that intravenous antifungal, oh, I mean vitamin C, helps these people? Haven't we found that zinc, which annihilates fungus, helps these people? Don't let them find that nystatin, which is both fungicidal and fungistatin. There are no viricidal drugs. There are vir virucidin products they're using at airport, bathrooms, and so forth. Those are for surfaces. Uh, virostatins are what these drugs overax and all these drugs are putting these patients on. To stop a virus, they don't kill the virus. They stop a virus. Nystatin both kills at a higher dose and stops fungal growth. If somebody, some wise, brilliant doctor out there watching this right now, let me caution you, doc. You're going to get in trouble. I mean, when hydroxychloroquine gets in trouble, you're going to get in trouble using Nystatin. You'll be ostracized. You can only use $1,000 drugs to help these poor patients get better. But I digress. Now, on to your questions. Thank you so much for them. Let me get a hit of this good old herb tea. I enjoy being with you guys. I try and prep so you get new in information. I had this happen, Robert. This blew my mind. And I'll tell you about it. Robert says, my wife has had a chronic cough since she was a child. She has been everywhere to no avail. Keeps us up at night. Could this be caused by a fungus? Yeah. And it more than likely is. Uh, Robert, I don't know where you live, but there is a, a doctor I help work with here who's a pulmonologist. He's been on my show several times. He's been on my show. I asked him not to paint my wagon. Just go on and tell what you're finding. He attended. I was the keynote speaker years ago at a doctor's symposium. That was Saturday night while they were eating dinner under a big, uh, beautiful chandelier. I gave my talk. He came up Sunday morning and sat next to me and said, you blew my socks off. And he said, I am robotically putting patients on antibiotics. Hey, I got it. And your wife has been on hundreds of them. They think that miraculously a new antibiotic is going to clear up her cough. Let me tell you how this works. Fungi gain access to your body, I think most of the time, through inhalation or eating them, right? Right here. Fungus has access to your body right here. Uh, fungus hangs on to the mucous membrane tissue, so the nasal, pharyngeal, throat, lungs, very viscous, very sticky. When your wife was little, she probably went into a basement, into an old abandoned building, and it was moldy, and she left, and the building has since been torn down, but she's carrying around those pathogenic fungi into her lungs. Uh, and a doctor would never know this. Unless the doctor uses an antifungal medicine, you heard me extol the virtues of Nystatin today. Um, if, if this were my wife, I would ask for a bronchoscopy looking for fungus. I'm sick of the bacteria. Yeah, sometimes they find bacteria. Most of the time, over 50, pushing 80 percent of the time, your wife has an 80 four out of five chance 
that the reason she's been coughing since she was a little girl was because a fungus got a hold of her and uh, wham. In certain foods, like a glass of wine, anytime you reduce your immunity a little bit more, even antibiotics can reduce immunity. They're mycotoxins. So I would ask for a bronchoscopy, and you don't want a bronchoscopy unless he's going to send off to a lab that does PCR testing. Um, PCR testing is newer fungus testing, because then in two days you're going to know. You want fungus and mycotoxins tested on that bronchoscopy. So they just put a tube in, go into the lungs, pull some out, and uh, test it using a PCR. Uh, and these machines are quite specific and quite sensitive. So that's what you want. That should yield nice statin and, if it's a yeast, diflucan. And if it's not, um, <laughs> John, John, John just brought me something. This guy and I go back too far. We have had so much fun through this. Just two old duffers. You know, God put us together 20 years ago. Uh, John, if I can paint his wagon for a minute, John, do you guys remember Alive and Well, the TV show? I think it was on CBS or something. I loved it. They had uh, all the popular nutrition people back then. Uh, well, John was the producer of that. And so he kind of slowed his life down. They relocated him to all pumped up and so forth. Well, here I am, the only non-physician. There's got to be 200 doctors, their wives, so 400 people in this ballroom out at a beautiful hotel out here in Plano, Texas. And I've got to loosen them up, right? And I'm t you talk about boring. The conference was called Mycotoxicology. <clears throat> it reeks of yawning, right? But they had great doctors there. Um, so I'm the keynote speaker. How do you follow up with that? These people want to eat. One of the doctor's <laughs> wives, John just handed me this. One of the doctor's wives got up and went over uh, to the, you know, they had the chocolate rolling off the ice and it was just all elegant. She walks over and I said, uh, okay, stop. Let me finish this next paragraph and then go over and see if you want. And everybody just rolled. I talked about mycotoxins, sugar feeding fungus and so forth, and they rolled. So that was the way I got them going uh, in the middle of my, that was fun. That was really fun. When you can get them laughing, you own them. You own them. I mean, it was really, really good. Uh, Robert, bronchoscopy uh, to diagnose fungal and mycotoxin-induced respiratory illness. I think you have a four out of five chance of finding certain fungi in there in either Spornox, Lamisil, or maybe Griseofulbin, but if there are yeast, by the way, this histoplasma capsulatum that they got on their shoes in the bat caves is a yeast. And the yeast and the virus, I believe, got together. More later on that. So bronchoscopy, followed by antifungal medication, I think, and a diet, a proper diet. Uh, get her the woman's book, the, the uh, fungus link to women's health problems. I think that'll really uh, make sense to her. Uh, and if you want, I'll introduce you to the doctor out here. A lot of people, it's interesting, like Julia, I just introduced you, my friend Julia, or Dr. Mukesh, he's a, 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 a medical doctor, internal medicine, pulmonology, he's got all sorts of degrees. But people choose to fly in, 250 bucks, no matter where you are, you can land here, stay at a hotel there, get a bronchoscopy and the antifungals you need, if he finds you need them. He probably will. Uh, thank you. Great start off question. Hey, Doug, uh, Francine wants to know, I hope I can, can you discuss viruses, antibody testing? It seems like scientists flip the script. <laughs> if, antib <laughs> if antibodies mean immunity, then why does it apply to HIV, herpes, HPV testing? Aren't vaccines supposed to create antibodies to disease? Thank you, thank you, thank you, man. Can I tell you, John and I will talk about this 20 minutes before we go home tonight, and same with Damon, the crew. You guys blow us away. This question needs to be on a science blog. You're a very smart audience. You're a thinking audience. Viruses and antibody testing. The two antibodies, I've seen the viral research, 
the two antibodies, we humans make five protective immunoglobins. They're also called antibodies. We make them via a B cell. It's a type of lymphocyte. We have T cell and B cell lymphocytes. B cells make antibodies, mirror images of that COVID coming in, right? And therefore render it harmless in our bloodstream and apply to immunorecognition next time and immunomemory, okay? That's really cool. I, I can't believe that we started as a seashell in the Indian Ocean. As I study human physiology and immunology, it blows me away, you guys, blows me away. I can't believe how complex it is. Of the five antibodies, the important ones for us to remember when coming to COVID testing or, or uh, Epstein-Barr, you know, any virus, um, are G and M. Now this test, they run up your nose, back to the back of your throat. That's a positive negative. Ooh, you got COVID. You know, come in here, you're running fever, da da da. So that's, that's what they tried to convince America. I loved as the news media was trying to get two cars in a row. You know, they opened up everywhere. Schools are closed, let's go to schools. Not many people got that testing done. I wouldn't have. Um, and now they're talking about a blood test, right? In our blood are these white blood cells that make these antibodies. Your question is a good one. You discuss uh, viruses and antibody testing. The blood test will test, here's what a doctor wants to know if he does, if he wants to know if you're currently suffering from COVID-19. If I were a physician, I would probably do the nasal scrape, the throat uh, scrape via the nose, and I would probably take a tube of blood, so I had two factors. Uh, I don't think that blood testing is expensive, but since it's popular now, it's medicine after all, it's probably very expensive. Um, I would test you for IgM. IgM is the brand new antibody. For a few weeks before that grows up and becomes IgG antibody, it's IgM. So if I wanna know if you've got an active infection, not a passive one, not one that's gone, which IgG will measure, but an active infection. I will do nasal testing and I'll do a little tube of blood for IgM testing. If that sucker comes back positive, both of them, I know you're suffering from COVID. So what do I do? You know, that, that's next. If this comes back IgG positive to COVID or any other thing, that's not helpful to me at all. That means in fourth grade, somebody with a virus, SARS, coughed on you and your body did, your immune system did what it was supposed to do. It made antibodies. IgM for the first few weeks, graduating to IgG antibodies, okay? Um, really, really good question. And you bring up another good one. If antibodies mean immunity, a folks, a, a COVID patient's blood becomes very valuable. I've heard of people selling their blood for a thousand bucks. I wish I had hours with you. Um, so the story goes, if you take a tube of your blood, let's say you have leukemia, as the story goes, right here, man, this is just great. You guys want to read more about this? This guy died a few years ago. He was the most awesome man you've ever, let's see, John, can they see that? I'm sure this book is all of two or three dollars. Uh, this is my signed copy, Politics of Healing by Dan Haley. It's a thick book. In this book, he writes, <laughs> man, look at all my old notes. Oh, fabulous book. Right now, it'd be a really good book. The Suppression and Manipulation of American Medicine. He was a state assemblyman in New York. And uh, he had Burke Burkett. Burke Burkett was a friend of his. Here it is, Berkeley Bedell, I'm sorry, former member of US Congress founder and president for the National Foundation of Alternative Medicine. Gone, I'll bet. At any rate, what Burke did, I think he had a serious disease. His doctor said, give me some of your blood. He took the blood to a farmer who had a pregnant cow. He injected his blood into the teat of the cow and that eventually became visceral in the cow. You guys know what colostrum is. When a mom feeds a baby, the first uh, few hours, that thick, dark 
uh, viscous material comes out, immunity, 100% immunity. So what uh, this farmer would do, the cow delivers, then he'd milk the cow and give the very thick stuff to Burke. And Burke would drink it. And he overcame his disease by doing that. Folks, that is called passive immunity. Vaccines are called active immunity. I wish they were. I'd love to tell you, and again, I'm not for or against. I love the idea, all of you need to hear this. I love the idea of giving me an antigen of COVID-19. Kind of like the idea of putting it under my tongue in sterile water. Just the antigen and sterile water. Because this, we were told in Vietnam, if we could not inject adrenaline into the heart of a soldier that was going down, get his mouth open, inject it under his tongue. This is a very, as you guys know, vascular area under, under the tongue. Okay, so sublingually I'd hold it. And if it was permeable, I don't have to worry about all the adjuvants, the additives. Gosh, what are there, 20 now that they put in a vaccine? Can I just tell you, I don't think they're bad people. I think ignorance abounds in science. There, I said it. I may be one of them too. Um, but you bring up such good questions. I just need to answer them. If antibodies mean immunity, then why isn't that applied to HIV, herpes, HPV testing? It's supposed to be. Theoretically, I would give a 10-year-old girl the human papillomas virus shots. Now, it's not all the human papillomas viruses. It's some of them. Well, which ones? Well, you got this one and this one. Go ahead and give it to her. Um, then I should draw her blood or his blood if they give it to boys. And I should see... Uh, anti-antibodies in that person's blood, IgG or M, right? And if you just gave the shot three days ago, I should see IgM. We just talked about that. Two years from now, in that girl's blood, I should see IgG antibodies to human papillomavirus. That isn't done because I don't think, they're so confused right now, they're finding that maybe we're not making antibodies after we've had this COVID, okay? Aren't vaccines supposed to create antibodies to the specific disease to make one immune from that disease? Antibodies on other tests mean that a person is infected. Okay, just, okay, Francis and everyone. <clears throat> what you've asked is this. Does the presence of an IgM antibody to COVID mean I'm protected or I've had it for a couple of weeks? I don't know. There's a huge amount. I hired three UCLA immunologists in my laboratory circa 1977. And you know what I did, you guys? They became my friends, my employees. I paid them well. When I had Evan, Ruth and I had Evan, uh, you know, we had books. This was one of my original books. Oh, my gosh, I saw it the other day. Maybe it was in my office. Nope, here. Okay, this guy, here's a book every woman should read. He died, Robert Mendelssohn, Confessions of a Medical Heretic. This was the most amazing. 25 years as a practicing pediatrician, uh, practicing physician. Uh, annual physical examinations are a health risk. Hospitalizations are dangerous places for sick people. Most operations do little good and do many harm. Medical testing laboratories are scandalously inaccurate. Many drugs cause more problems than they cure. X-rays are the most pervasive and most dangerous tools in a doctor's office. Uh, this book's probably a buck. Everybody. He also wrote, this is medical heretic, he wrote, um, he wrote how to have a healthy child in spite of his pediatrician. He really did. And this was a big guy. He, he's a bigwig in medicine. God rest his soul. And he wrote how doctors manipulate women. Unreal. If you can get these books, it's a good jump off if you're brand new at all this. Does the presence of an antibody 
specific to an antigen, a foreign substance capable of eliciting an immune response, imply immunity. Thank you, Francis. If it does, nobody would have ragweed allergy because we all inhale it, and yet 4% of Americans start sneezing and sneezing and sneezing and getting sick. You guys are asking the right questions. God bless you. This is the best audience in the world. I love doing this. Uh, is it uh, Shuba? Is there a good immunology book that you could recommend to get a better understanding on how the immune system works? Now, some of you bought this. I think many of you probably bought it. But I want to show you something that will be cheap if you can find it. Doot, 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 doot. Um, boy, I held it up here. You guys remember? I bet you guys have it somewhere. Oh, there's the woman's book. Mm, I wish I could see that. It was a magazine. Ah, here it is. I hit it. <clears throat> here you go, John. National Geographic Magazine. Shuba, get this one. I'll tell you what it is. See, it's got a big old lion on, or a tiger on the, whatever that is. Ooh, it looks like a, what is that? That's a pretty animal. Leopard, a snow leopard. Okay, this is volume 169, number 6, June 1986. National Geographic. Our immune system, the wars within. This is a simple, look at this is a simple to read. That's the white blood cell gobbling up the bacteria. I love this. If you can get this, you can get it for a buck or two online. But it is June 1968, National Geographic. Best thing I've ever read on the immune system. <clears throat> Short of the Woman's Guide to Fungal Diseases. Um, Our free radicals, Maria, thank you. Thank you for answering all the questions. What a blessing. Thank you. Our free radicals, reason uh, for this virus, our free radicals, um, unpaired electrons. Um, my take is this. I'm a sitting duck. I'm a wooden duck. You know, for a hunter to go up, easy prey, because I'm 70 years old. Fortunately, I don't have any comorbidities. I don't have any other illnesses, knock on wood. But we old people, as we age, our immunity waxes and wanes. We begin to slide. Look, we're all, I'm so upset with Eve about eating that apple, or Adam, I guess, for eating that apple. Um, as we get older, we become more vulnerable to viruses, bacteria, fungal conditions, and so forth. Uh, and I don't think it's free radicals so much. Free radicals part of the chain of deterioration. But I think it's vulnerability as we age or people who eat horribly fast foods all the time, no exercise. Think about this, guys. You, I'm going to say this again. Everyone watching this right now has within your front pocket a key that opens your health. We turn it over to, I'm going to go in for my annual physical. Doctors will find something wrong with you, okay? My last physical, someone asked me on, uh, what was I doing? Oh, oh, it was a get-together with friends. Uh, someone said, so you don't go to the doctor. No, I don't, you know. I go to the dentist, don't go to the doctor. And uh, he said, uh, when was your last physical? So my exit physical from the Navy was 1972. It's the last time. I have no plans on going back. In my front pocket, I have opened the box, and in the box there is not an off on switch. I can't turn cancer off. But I believe there's a rheostat. I believe you can turn it way down. Better, I believe that you can prevent the onset of these diseases by living a lifestyle conducive to excellent immune system health. Okay? So that's what I try and teach. Thank you so much. Great questions. Uh, oh, that, this is great. Kramer. I love this. Love your early morning show. Outstanding information on dental implants. That was given by my friend. Uh, his website is My Holistic Dentist. MyHolisticDentist.com. This man's name is Kerry O'Reilly. He's a dentist in San Diego. And uh, I gave a lecture. I think it was Ty Bollinger's lecture a couple of years ago. 
on uh, the fungal link to cancer. And there were so many people that surrounded me, maybe 500, some of you might have been there, that they asked me to leave so the next speaker could go on. And we went outside and people were just grabbing at me. I mean, I felt like a rock star. And so many of them get it, you guys, when I tell them, when did your cancer begin? Well, it started in uh, mm, it breast cancer. It started in uh, 2004. What happened in 2004? Nothing. Everybody, first thing, they nothing. Oh, yeah, that's right, we moved. Okay. You have to ask them, did you get dental work done? Yeah, but, you know, it's just a root canal. You guys dig, dig, dig. Something initiates the disease process. Something takes the glasses off your T cells. Something breaks immunity. Aging is part of it. But so often we don't know a bee sting could do this. When did my symptoms begin? What was I doing? Um, Doug, all I had was a handful of peanuts and, you know, I passed out. Those peanuts were probably impregnated, and most are, with something called aflatoxin. It causes human cancer, and it can mess with your nervous system. When did your problems begin? And stress can do this, a divorce. You know, when did your problems begin? Let's go back, work backwards, and try and fix it. So this is Dr. Kerry O'Reilly. Love your morning show. Outstanding information on dental implants. Wasn't that good? MyHolisticDentist.com. And if you want to go on there and talk to him, just say, hey, get our annual. It used to be called a physical. Then it became an annual. Maybe it ought to be a biannual. Maybe it ought to be a weekly. That's where they're moving with all this to get you on medications. Um, what if we do make cancer cells from time to time? What if you've scheduled a physical for July 17th? already scheduled. And on the night of July 16th, uh, you start to make cancer cells. And the doctor says, well, everything looks good. Let's take a tube of blood and make sure. <gasps> Linda, I have horrible news for you. You have leukemia. We've got to get you in for... See my point? Um, I, I don't think women should have pelvic exams done when they're drinking alcohol the night before or on antibiotics. I don't think men should have digital rectal exams when they're on antibiotics or they're drinking alcohol. Why? Both of these are mycotoxins fully capable of looking like cancer cells or creating worse. Six of these mycotoxins are probable or definite carcinogens. And a doctor doesn't know that hammering down a beer or two can't grow a lump on your prostate. You guys, you know, it's so easy. We just say no to drugs. Okay, which drugs? You know, it's just, if your immune system isn't working and you find yourself on lots of antibiotics, work to fix it. Diet alone, exercise alone. So good question, Alice, thank you. What if, what if the day my physical is scheduled, I make cancer cells that night? Ian. I have psoriasis, eczema on my face and scalp. I've been on the carnivore diet with uh, high quality local meats for a year. Has greatly improved. The sun really helps this summer. Yeah, it does. It's not totally gone though. When I eat sauerkraut or fermented foods, it seems to flare up. Okay, that's likely a die off. On occasion, I've had alcohol, eggs, cheese, which cause it to flare up. Does a candida detox with your carrot juice and apple cider vinegar make sense? Yeah, I eat a very low carb diet, almost no sugar. Good for you. Any ideas? Yeah, I do. So, Ian, I worked uh, for uh, three doctors that brought me here from Los Angeles to Dallas in 1986, temporarily, until they saw my work. And then they made me an offer in 1987 to permanently pick my family up, two little kids at that time, and relocate here permanently, or for five years under contract. It was a skin clinic, so we saw psoriasis all the time. And I asked the doctors, and man, I had to sell this. I had to be good. I had to prove myself first. I wasn't a doctor. They are. And, uh, and then I had to beg this. Can I have every psoriasis or eczema patient you have, and can I put them on the Kaufman diet, Kaufman 1, just for a few weeks, and I promise, Diflucan and Nystatin or Spornox and Nystatin, just for a couple of weeks. Well, are you saying these are fungal? 
I'm saying we need to rule out fungus. And now, don't you know the Center for Disease Control says think fungus? And I was 50 years early. So I do have a thought. This is so characteristic. When you're eating the good bacteria, the antifungal stuff, um, it tends to flare up. You, to kill fungus perfectly is to kill the human cells perfectly. So you can't do that. Um, what you want to do is put this thing to rest so that when you eat sauerkraut or yogurt, you won't end up with that uh, good bacteria inducing a die-off. I would ask the doctor, let's see, you had, okay, we used to use with great success um, Diflucam 200 milligrams a day uh, for 10 days, then one every other day uh, for a couple of weeks, and my statin, one million units, always uh, the doctors uh, may change the dosage, I'm not a doctor, but one million units with meals twice a day, a.m. and p.m. Nystatin and Diflucan. And I think within a couple of months, Ian, you're going to find, whew, finally put it to bed. Brilliant of you um, to go on this diet, carnivore diet and so forth. Clean meats. Mm -mm. Love those clean meats. Okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, got that, got that. How does one treat if diagnosed with cancer but feels it's fungus? Mary Jo asked this. Doctors are pushing for removal and other cancer treatments. Uh, uh, out of no, maybe I don't know, out of no where I was diagnosed. Esophageal cancer. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, Mary Jo, diagnosed with esophageal cancer. I think the best way to do this is to contact a laboratory that does uh, PCR, polymerase chain reaction, PCR testing in advance and ask the pathologist, ask the doctor in charge, I'm going to send some biopsy tissue to you. I'd like to have it uh, reviewed for fungi and mycotoxins. You probably, I'm sure, esophageal cancer, you've already had the biopsy. A biopsy must be maintained in paraffin until they know you die. So it's at the hospital where the, you know, every probably 50 years they throw a bunch of these away. Um, but you can, you have access. That's your tissue. You can call the hospital and get it sent to a pathology laboratory where they do PCR, polymerase chain reaction testing for fungus and myco, MYCO, mycotoxins. That's the first thing I do. So if your heart, women are so good at this. If your gut and your heart, Mary Jo, are telling you, you know, I've listened to Doug, and I have been exposed to a lot of fungus, and it was down here, and you know, you swallow food, and uh, maybe, maybe it is. Um, Real-time labs, real-time labs is in Richardson, Texas, and those pathologists, by the way, John, that was the doctor, those were the doctors that invited me to that symposium under the chandelier. Remember that? Real-time labs put on that symposium. Uh, that was Dr. Uh, Dennis Hooper. He was in the Navy, same time I was, Dr. Dennis Hooper. Good guy. I hope that helps. God bless you. Look, if this is a fungus, I love the idea, like Ian was just saying, of juicing with apple cider vinegar and, and, and falcarinol, which is in carrot juice. I love the idea of greens, spinach, and Italian parsley in that. I love the idea of taking charge of your health and asking your doctor to get these things tested. By the by, what's with these doctors who say no? That's my tissue. I paid for it in that lab. I want to get some of it transferred to another lab where a pathologist, just like you, Doc, will look at it under different eyes. Good for you. I wish you well. Um, yeah, this is my husband. Uh, my friend's husband was diagnosed. I just got this last night. I called someone. Hmm. My friend's husband was just diagnosed with early Alzheimer's. Uh, they eat very clean, uh, but are there other supplements that you can recommend? So this big symposium is going around, and the guy... The guy who hosted it, 
uh, Dr. Josh called me the other day and he said, it's a hit. It's a huge hit. Alzheimer's, it's on my website. I was one of the speakers at it. And in this, Joan, uh, in this, I'm sorry, Joyce, Joan's next. In this uh, symposium, I just cut to the chase. How do we give Alzheimer's to study bunnies, to study rats? How do we break their memory like that? We inject them with a mushroom mycotoxin. It's called ibotenic acid. Ibotenic acid is a mycotoxin. And within a year, they start losing their mind. You don't suppose that 70 years of drinking mycotoxins, because my cardiologist says it's good for my heart, um, and eating bread and cereals contaminated sometimes, I don't think rarely, with mycotoxins, eating bread, eating pasta, um, you know, taking antibiotics, these are all mycotoxin exposures, that it finally reaches a fulcrum, you know, over which my brain doesn't seem to work anymore. Okay? I think I would run a one-month test. I'd put your, hus your friend's husband on the Kaufman One diet, and I'd ask the doctor, yeast or fungus, I'd ask the doctor for Diflucan. Maybe he'll give 150 milligrams a day for two weeks. On day 15, how's he doing? Better? You don't cure Alzheimer's or cancer or lupus or arthritis or depression in 10 days. But you have what the doctor may never get. You have hope. You have an understanding, holy cow, 15 days, it really is better. I feel so much better. And the doctor doesn't get to see that. He doesn't go home with you. A doctor never thinks fungus, rarely thinks diet. You've got to do your own thing to get yourself better. You've heard me say this, and I'm going to say it again. Kids, sometimes we're on our own. We really are. You've got to prove it to yourself first. So 15 days or 14 days on Diflucan and a restrictive diet. Oh, lots of goodies. Man, I had my cheesecake the other night. It is delicious. Lots of goodies. But restrict sugars and, and yeast from your diet for a period of time. Then, Joyce, you're going to know. Okay? Uh, supplements. Yeah, the supplement would be Diflucan and Nystatin. It's on my website, Getting Started, Pull Down, Doctor's Fungal Protocol. Print off those two pages. Take it to his doctor and uh, maybe he'll give them Diflucan and Nystatin. If you follow the diet while you're on those two, you're gonna know in a couple of weeks if there's improvement. Improvement does not imply, or certainly it doesn't mean cure. Well, what about six more months on that? Okay, uh, so Joan said, I, my daughter had gallbladder removal two years ago after her second child, full of stones, yeah. Do you know if she can take to help her digestion? She's now 14 weeks pregnant, congratulations, number three child. Man, they're precious. Man, they're precious. Very few things in life. My wife uh, and those grandkids, man, I just, oh. Coco, Coco, come with me. Let me show you this. Can I get on your back? It's so much fun. To be able at 70 years old to let them on my back is just a miracle. Um, okay, Joan, do me a favor. Unikey, U-N-I-K-E-Y. That's my friend, Dr. Rob. Um, come on, John. Thank you. <laughs> Do you guys notice my brain begins leaving? We taped a doctor today, and then I studied and studied, and I wrote two blogs. My brain starts fizzling out. Um, Dr. Ann Louise Gittleman uh, knows more about the gallbladder than anybody I've ever known. Unikey.com, U-N-I-K-E-Y. Uh, tell her Doug sent you, and you have this question. Uh, oh, she, have you heard of the, the lemon juice and, and virgin cold-pressed olive oil drink? Go online, gallbladder flush, uh, lemon oil, olive oil. Go online and read about that. It sure helped my sister and other people. Um, Marlene asked, Doug, do you have to count calories on the Kaufman diet, which is why I love it. I'll be 170 pounds, you know, probably the rest of my life. Never counted a calorie in my life. Won't do it eat the right foods. The wrong foods induce inflammation. Grains, right? Inflammation. Greens, not. Beth, I always love hearing from Beth, another big brain person. I'm betting massive amounts of Cheerios. 
Oh, Cheetos. Oh, Cheetos. Oh, Cheetos, yeah. How long is too long on Diflucan and Nystatin? You guys will know. Your symptoms will begin coming back. This is what I watched in the, uh, all the doctor's patients I worked with. Look, I'm into drugs, antifungal drugs, for up to a month. If I have cancer, if I'm losing my vision, if I get crackling migraines, if I'm so depressed I'm suicidal, if my bowels don't work, I'm, up, I'm doing it for a month and the Kaufman diet. Then I'm going off. Why? Because we have darn good nutraceuticals that I think can take over after we wash it out of our system. I, Karen, Karen says, I can't spell anything you talk about. Gosh, I'm sorry. I never wanted it to be like that. Want to hear the funny thing? I can't either. I, can't, I can say it. I can't spell it. I'll try and slow it down. I'm betting massive amounts of Cheetos and bad eating grains cause my cancers. I also lived very high, high stress jobs, as well as had jars of peanut for quick eating never having time for lunch. Wow. Talk about feeding myself fungus. Thanks to Doug's books, programs, and now Facebook Live, things have greatly improved. Seven years clean of cancer now. Gosh, if I were a crier, stuff like this, you don't know what it does to me. Every day of my life, I get testimonials like this. Um, Beth, you're my bud. Uh, okay, so here's Mary Jo again. Who do I ask? Who do I ask? My PCP, primary care physician, I guess. I have PET scans, CAT scans tomorrow. I'm meeting with surgeon oncologist. Issue is, I'm only eating liquid diet now, as I have acid reflux. Yeah. I wish. Okay, I wish I could be Mary Jo for one year, and Mary Jo, I wish you could wake up every morning like I do and feel great and pop out of bed and get ready for work and love my job and study and all of the testimonials I get. In one year, you'd never go back to Mary Jo. But I would like to take Mary Jo and I wish there were a way to do this and, and make her whole again. Make her feel in three months, four months, Beth did it. Make her feel in three or four months like a million bucks. And I don't think doctors know how to do that. I just don't think. Yeah, you can ask your primary care physician. Um, I have CAT scan, PET scans tomorrow. Ask the doctor if you can send the biopsy out for mycology testing. You know, Doc, I suspect, if you're anything like me, I had a drinking problem in my early 20s. After I got back from Vietnam, um, I lived in moldy apartments. Uh, I was on tons of antibiotics, as was just the way to do it back in the 60s. So you can make that argument. So look, I've been exposed to a lot of mold and their mycotoxins. I'd like, half, I'd like my sample to be split and sent to a laboratory that can test me for mold and mycotoxins. You'll get the typical, oh, well, you don't, you know, this is cancer. Your scans have come back. It's cancer. I could tell you stories that would blow you guys away. Uh, so, yes, I would start with your primary care doctor. Be nice. Tracy says, I know I start with Kaufman one diet. I go to a doctor with your letter and start the protocol with detoxing from fungus. Is that right? Not knowing exactly what it is. Uh, I bought all NSC digestive cleanse. That's a good one, by the way. I have not started. I feel, I watch, I read anything I can pull from anywhere. Tracy's like me a while ago. I'm very susceptible to smells, especially chemicals, definitely yeast, beer. I have one drink, I sneeze, my sinuses are totally clogged. Childhood, I was always on antibiotics in the hospital with pneumonia. A couple of times, double pneumonia, currently brain fog, arthritis, uh, back and shoulder pain, depression, have had shingles three times, bilateral. Hey, Tracy, go to live at knowthecause.com, give us your last name, and, uh, and, uh, Give, a, give me a mailing address. I'm going to send you a really early Christmas gift. Two books. The Diet Guide, the new one, and this book that you see behind me, uh, The Fungus Link to Women's Health Problems. My gosh. You will not put them down. You'll stay up that night reading them. And I think it's really going to point you in the right direction. I'm glad you're aboard. Thank you. Thank you for telling your friends about this. And I'm going to see that you get started off on the wrong foot. They'll be there in four or five days. You won't be able to put them down. 
That's the program I'd follow. Sometimes what these doctors have told me I've worked with, do we even need these drugs anymore, Doug? After a couple of weeks, their arthritis is clearing up, their brain fog is clearing up, the diet's working, can't we just... One doctor who's an internal medicine doctor told John and I maybe two years ago on that set over there that after two to three weeks on antifungals, I take the patient off because your diet sustains them. Bingo. That's what you and I want, that key in your front pocket, diet. Do you wear a mask? I... <laughs> no, no, I don't. I keep a mask in my rear pocket. I went out and got my wife something for Mother's Day. And when I went to this place, I went in. They looked paranoid to me. Everybody in the place had a mask. Simply pulled it out, put it on, and it took me back 50 years to the operating rooms in Da Nang, 1st Medical Battalion, when we would do three-hour surgery on a guy who lost his arm. And the mask, you'd start sweating through it, and you'd start hyperventilating your own carbon dioxide. I don't like masks. Obviously, in the operating room, you have to wear them. I think if you're coughing and you're sick, uh, or maybe if you're old, you know, like me, maybe I scare people, um, then that's okay. I've been in many places since where nobody had a mask on. I feel just, here's probiotics, get some good psyllium and uh, change your diet and see if the itis, anytime we end something in itis, like cystitis, it means inflammation, swelling, see if the itis doesn't clear up in a month. That's what I would do. Uh, Marsha, 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 boy, I have to contact her. Marsha, I have been crazy busy. Marsha is another naturopathic doctor. She's in Indiana. Uh, Indiana. Those of you who are uh, wanting to see a good naturopath. Marcia, do you agree with me? Do you think in five years we're gonna see doctor, medical doctor visits go like this and naturopathic visits go like this? I really think we're gonna see that. I'm betting on it. Um, so any suggestions for natural approaches to Bartonella? Um, is it Bartonella? Is it Bartonella? I can't tell you how many protozoal diseases that I have seen that responded favorably to an antifungal program, beyond coincidental. Any natural approaches? Uh, here's what I would do. I would use an antifungal program for six weeks. At the end of the six weeks, retest. Where are you then? Love hearing from you. Um, Olivia says, hey Doug, I've been on your Kaufman One Diet for about a month now and it's been great. How many carbs is too much on the diet? We don't count carbs. We eat when we're hungry, we eat till we're full. Cassava and coconut flour, okay, yes. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, yep. Does alcohol get cravings from the fungus? He got from all the drinking. Let's see, does alcohol get cravings from the fungus he got? Oh, from the fungus he got from all the drinking. Wow, really good question, Vicki. Let's just see, I think, can we discuss pediatric brain tumors. Shelby, man, that's huge. Can I do that Tuesday? Yes. Uh, in the interim, go on my website. I have on my home, you're on my website. I have on my home page is cancer and fungus. Are they related? Is coconut or monk okay? Good. Connor, thank you. Yes. Uh, I know Afrin is bad, but it sure does help. Afrin induces something we call rhinitis medicamentosa, where the tissue, and this may help answer uh, Vicki's question also, where the tissue, instead of Afrin taking it down, it begins swelling, waiting for the next shot of Afrin. Really, rhinitis, medicamentosa. Uh, and so that's why I like, you know, other methods. I, I use everything from uh, oregano to cinnamon to uh, grapefruit seed extract. You should see, at night before I go to bed, every other night or so, I'll shoot one of them in my sinuses. Discuss. I wish I could talk more with Shelby about this. Discuss pediatric brain tumors. Yeah. Um, does an alcoholic get cravings from the fungus he got from all the drinking? In a human fungal relationship, so says Dr. Elizabeth Moore Landacker, that book right there, Fundamentals of the Fungi. In a human fungal relationship, 
fungi become the dominant partners. If it doesn't get more alcohol or more carbohydrates, which alcohol is, or more pasta or bread or pizza, you know where I'm going with this, it begins dying. It hates to die. Alcohol is a carbohydrate craving that feeds fungus. Yes. God bless you guys. I've had a ball. Get a lot of sleep tonight. And I'll see you back here Tuesday. I think really in honor of, uh, who was that that asked? I'm going to talk a little bit more. I'm going to answer Mona. She asked me about uh, biopsy and they look uh, suspicious for cancer. I think she's learned a lot during this show. And the person who just asked me, and I probably threw it on the floor, I'm sorry, about pediatric brain tumors. We need to talk. Maybe I'll open with a little update on COVID. Man, it's so amazing. It's so amazing.